ഹായ് എവറി വൺ വെൽക്കം ബാക്ക് ടു ദ ക്ലാസ് ഓഫ് ഇന്ത്യൻ റൈറ്റിംഗ് ഇൻ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് വി ആർ കണ്ടിന്യൂയിങ് ദ ആർട്ടിക്കൽ ഇമാജിനറി ഹോം ലാൻഡ്സ് റിട്ടൺ ബൈ സൽമാൻ റഷിദി ലെറ്റ്സ് ബിഗിൻ വിത്ത് ദ സെക്കൻഡ് പാരഗ്രാഫ് ഇൻ പേജ് നമ്പർ സെവൻറ്റി സിക്സ് ഇൻ യുവർ ടെക്സ്റ്റ് ബുക്ക് ഇൻ കോമൺ വിത്ത് മെനി ബോംബെ റേസ്ഡ് മിഡിൽ ക്ലാസ് ചിൽഡ്രൻ ഓഫ് മൈ ജനറേഷൻ ഐ ഗ്രൂ അപ്പ് with an intimate knowledge of and even sense of friendship with a certain kind of England. A dream England composed of test matches at Lord's presided over by the voice of John R. Lord at which Freddie Truman bowled unceasingly and without success at Poli Umriga of Enid Blyton and Billy Bunter. in which we were even prepared to smile indulgently at a portrait such as hari jamset ram singh the dusky nabob of bhanipur i wanted to come to england i couldn't wait and to be fair england has done all right by me but i find it a little difficult to be properly grateful I can't escape the view that my relatively easy ride is not the result of the dream England's famous sense of tolerance and fair play but of my social class my free fair skin and my english english accent take away any of these and the story would have been very different because of course the dream england is no more than a dream he says that like many other bombay raised middle class children of his generation he grew up with a certain romantic idea of england he was extremely enthusiastic about going to england in his teens he was inspired by Test matches at Lord's presided over by the voice of John R. Lord. John R. Lord was an English journalist, author and cricket commander for the BBC's Test Match special, at which Freddie Truman bowled unceasingly and without success at Poli Umriga of Enid Blyton and Lily Bunder. in which they were even prepared to smile intelligently at a portrait such as hari jamset ram singh who is hari jamset ram singh the character hari jamset ram singh the nabob of banipur from frank richard school boy fiction is considered in the broader context of Richard's construction of the ethnic other and found to be relatively inoffensive. Salman Rushdie's criticism of the Nabob character is shown to owe more to misinterpretations such as George Orwell's in Boys Weeklies than to the original character. And he admits that it has not entirely let him down although he knows that is only because of his hailing from a privileged social class his unnaturally fair skin and his british accent he knows that without these advantages it would have been a very different story for him because the real england is not as romantic as the image he had in mind before arriving bombay le middle class family il jenichu valarna salman rushdie ke englandil poganam ennum avade settle eyanam ennulla aagraham cherpu mudale undayirunnu adhe parayunnathu adhe thana adine sahayichathu tande social classum tande velutha തൊലിയും അതുപോലെ തന്നെ ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് ലാംഗ്വേജിലുള്ള പരിജ്ഞാനവുമായിരുന്നു എന്നാണ് ഇതൊന്നുമില്ലായിരുന്നെങ്കിൽ താൻ സ്വപ്നം കണ്ടതുപോലെ തൻ്റെ ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് ജീവിതം മനോഹരമായിരിക്കില്ല എന്നാണ് അദ്ദേഹം വ്യക്തമാക്കുന്നത് 
Sadly, it's a dream from which too many white Britons refuse to awake. Recently, on a live radio program, a professional humorist asked me, in all seriousness, why I objected to being called a woke. What means a person who is not white. He said he had always thought it is a rather charming word, a term of endearment. I was at the zoo the other day, he revealed, and a zookeeper told me that the walks were best with the animals. They stuck their fingers in their ears and wiggled them about and the animals felt at home. The ghost of Hari Jamset Ram Singh works among us still. However, Reshdi says that many white Britons refuse to tell the fact and insist that the romantic image is the reality. He then recounts an incident when a professional humorist made a culturally insensitive comment in a live radio program with him and tried to justify their racial prejudices against brown people. Rashdi's intention is to show the shameless acceptance of racism in British society. Rashdi ke live aitlo yu radio program ilu la anipavam pangu vichu wonder. Adiham name ormi pikunada. Englandil nilanil kunna racial prejudices ne kurchan. As Richard Wright found long ago in America, black descriptions of society and white are no longer compatible. Fantasy or the mingling of fantasy and naturalism is one way of dealing with these problems. It offers a way of echoing in the form of our work the issues faced by all of us. How to build a new modern world out of an old legend haunted civilization an old culture which we have brought into the heart of a newer one but whatever technical solutions we may find indian writers in these islands like others who have migrated to the north from the south are capable of writing from a kind of double perspective because they, we are at one and the same time insiders and outsiders in this society. This stereoscopic vision is perhaps what we can offer in place of whole sight. Citing the African-American writer Richard Wright, Reshdi explains that Black and white depictions of society are no longer compatible or agreeable. In other words, different cultures have different ways of understanding and describing the world. One way of dealing with the problem, he says, is the mixing of fantasy and naturalism in art. Through these lines, Salman Rishiti reminds us we can see the difference in cultures and we can see the differences between how we are understanding the cultures and how we are describing the world. So how we can solve the problem? He says we can mix the fantasy and naturalism in art. But irrespective of technique, he says that Indian writers outside the country are capable of bringing in a kind of double perspective into their work. They are not capable of providing whole sight, but they can offer this stereoscopic vision instead. Stereoscopic means relating to or denoting a process by which two photographs of the same object taken at slightly different angles are viewed together 
creating an impression of depth and solidity he is sure indian writers outside the country they are capable of bringing a kind of double perspective into their work because they can offer the stereoscopic vision instead we can move to the next paragraph there is one last idea that i should like to explore even though it may on first hearing seem to contradict much of what i have so far said it is this of all the many elephant traps lying ahead of us the largest and most dangerous pitfall would be the adoption of a ghetto mentality to forget that there is a world beyond the community to which we belong to confine ourselves within narrowly defined cultural frontiers would be to go voluntarily into that form of internal exile which in south africa is called the homeland we must guard against creating for the most virtuous of reasons british indian literary equivalents of bobutaswana or the transke however reshdi also wants the indian english writer to look out for the danger of succumbing or surrendering to a ghetto mentality of limiting themselves within narrowly defined cultural boundaries what is ghetto mentality ghetto mentality is one in which people's mindset about life is informed by poverty and fear although the people may have physically moved out of the ghetto they are still psychologically stuck this is called ghetto mentality so here reshdi wants the indian english writer you don't surrender to a ghetto mentality you should have the courage to write freely he says to go voluntarily into that form of internal exile which in south africa is called homeland according to him british indian literary equivalents to bofus taswana or the transke bofus taswana means former republic that was the legally designated homeland for the republic of south africa's swana people it is already given in your textbook transkei means former republic and homeland of black south africans of soza descent it was an unrecognized state in the southeastern region ghetto mentality il ninnum sadhairyam munnotu varanam ennulla oru kaalchapaadana reshdi ivide pangu vekkunnathu this raises immediately the question of whom one is written for my own short answer is that i have never had a reader in mind i have ideas people events shapes and i write for those things and hope that the completed work will be of interest to others but which others in the case of midnight children i certainly felt that if it's subcontinental readers had rejected the work i should have thought it a failure no matter what the reaction in the west so i would say that i write for people who feel part of the things i write about but also for everyone else whom i can reach i am of the same opinion as ralph ellison who says that he finds something precious in being black in america but that he is also reaching for more than that i was taken very clearly he writes with a passion to link together all i loved within the negro community and 
all those things i felt in the world which lay beyond western writers have felt free to be eclectic in their selection of theme setting form i'm sure we must grant ourselves an equal freedom and this he says leads to the question of identifying the audience for whom one is writing he states that in his own case he has never had a particular set of readers in mind but the case of midnight's children he admits that he would have considered the book a failure had it not received the kind of appreciation it did from the readers in the subcontinent respective of what response it had generated among western readers oru eluthukarinum tande srishtiyil erpedumbol idu aaru vaaikkum enno ee vaaikkuna vaayanakkarude abhiruji endanenno chindikkendilla ennaanu adheham parayunnathu thus he says that along with the african american writer ralph ellison's collection of essays shadow and act he writes for people who can identify with his work as well as anyone else his work is able to reach ralph ellison da adhe abhiprayam thaneyana salman rushdie yum follow cheynathu ralph parayunnathu അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ വർക്ക് ആർക്കൊക്കെ തിരിച്ചറിയാൻ പറ്റും അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ വർക്ക് ആരിലൊക്കെ എത്താൻ സാധിക്കും അവരെക്കുറിച്ച് മാത്രമേ ചിന്തിക്കേണ്ടതുള്ളൂ അവർക്ക് വേണ്ടിയാണ് നാം എഴുതേണ്ടത് എന്നാണ് ആർട്ട് ഈസ് പാഷൻ ഓഫ് ദ മൈൻഡ് ദർ ഇസ് നോ നീഡ് ടു എക്സ്പ്ലെയിൻ ദ സെൻറ്റൻസ് ഹി സീസ് വെസ്റ്റേൺ റൈറ്റേഴ്സ് ഹാവ് ഓൾവേസ് ഹാവ് ഫെൽറ്റ് ഫ്രീ to be eclectic in their selection of theme setting form so he is sure they must grant ourselves an equal freedom he also calls for a broad approach as far as selection of theme is concerned the writers have the freedom to express their thoughts freely indian writers in england have access to a second tradition however quite apart from their own racial history it is the cultural and political history of the phenomenon of migration displacement life in a minority group we can quite legitimately claim as our ancestors the huguenots the irish the jews the past to which we belong is an english past the history of immigrant britain swift conrad marx are as much our literary forebears as tagore or ram mohan roy america a nation of immigrants has created great literature out of the phenomenon of cultural transplantation out of examining the ways in which people cope with a new world it may be that by discovering what we have in common with those who preceded us into this country we can begin to do the same he says that apart from the literary tradition of their mother country indian writers in england can also lay claim to the tradition of immigrant writers in england like swift conrad and marx we can move to the next paragraph i stress that this is only one of many possible strategies but we are in escapably international writers at a time when the novel has never been a more international form and it is perhaps one of the more pleasant freedoms of the literary migrant to be able to choose his parents my own selected half consciously half not include gogol cervantes kafka melville 
Meshadu sees a polyglot family tree against which I measure myself and to which I would be honored to belong. But he also points out that the novel itself has turned into a very international form in literature and writing novels inevitably makes one an international writer. He believes that one of the most pleasant freedoms enjoyed by the literary migrant is that he can pick his own set of literary predecessors. His own chosen forebearers include Gogol, Cervantes, Kafka, Melville and Mesodosis, a list that includes writers from multiple linguistic and cultural backgrounds. We can identify that he was highly inspired by these writers. There is a beautiful image in Saul Bellow's latest novel, The Dean's December. The central character, the Dean Cod, hears a dog barking wildly somewhere. He imagines that the barking is the dog's protest against the limits of dog experience. For God's sake, the dog is saying, open the universe a little more. Bello is not really talking about dogs or not only about dogs and I have the feeling that the dog's rage and its desire is also mine, ours, everyone's. For God's sake, open the universe a little more. In the conclusion of his essay, he alludes to a section from the novel The Dean's December by Saul Bello. In the novel, the central character hears a dog barking wildly and he imagines that through his barking the dog is protesting against the limits of his experiences as a dog and perhaps praying for the universe to open up a little more. Reshdi knows that the writer is using the dog only as a metaphor for the human individual and says that the desire of the dog to experience a broader universe is the desire of every Indian English writer in England. He also adds the song sung by Gibril Farista. Through this article, he reminds us Indian English writer has the freedom to write what he thinks, what he experiences, what he imagines. Definitely, it's very important open the universe a little more. We covered the article Imaginary Homelands written by Salman Rishti. We will begin the new chapter in our next class. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you.